Thank you all for joining us. We'll be starting within a minute. Thank you for all of those that joined us. We'll be starting within a minute. Then I think that the majority has already joined us, so we can start. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this webinar about the importance of PV modules extended reliability testing for harsh environment applications. This webinar is sponsored by Longi Solar, the leading global energy company that is the only solar PV manufacturer with more than 65 gigawatts of modules annual capacity. We are proud to have a very experienced panel with speakers from, Long from Longi Solar and PV Evolutions Lab, uh, better known as PVL. If you're not, we're not able to join us via Zoom, then you may watch us live on SolarAbix Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn channels, and the recording will be also available on YouTube. So before we start, I'd like to ask you please to write in the chat box if you can hear me clearly. And if you are watching us on social media, then please write it in the comments if you can hear my voice clearly and you can see me. So I see Mr. Youssef answering and uh, Mr. Imam, Mr. Hardik. Mr. Ayman, thank you very much for confirming that you can hear me well. Well, the place where you just sent your message, please don't use it for questions. You, please send all of your questions in the Q&A section and keep the chat section for introductions in case you want to know each other and extend your network, then please use the chat section to socialize, but please keep the, all of the Q&A, um, um, all of the questions in the Q&A section. And if you are on social media, then write it in the comments and our team will gather these questions and then share it with me. So I'll start with introductions. My name is Monif Barakat, I'm from Solar Arabic, which is the biggest renewable energy platform dedicated for renewable energy in the Middle East and Africa. And I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today in the order of appearance in the webinar. First, Mr. Tristan Aaron Lorico. He is the Vice President of Sales and Marketing in the PV Evolutions Lab, P PVL. And second, Mr. Kevin Robinson, who is the Product and Solutions Manager for the Middle East and Africa and Central Asia regions at Longi uh, Solar. The importance of today's topic, especially in the harsh environment of the Middle East and Africa, is the difficulty of determining and procuring the PV modules that would perform up to their specs reliably and safely. A lot of certifications and standards exist, and the most manufacturers claim compliance with these standards, so it is not easy to make the decision to choose the reliable and high-performance modules. To help you with such decisions, my esteemed speakers will speak today about the following topics. First, we will talk about an introduction for the IEC standards for the PV modules reliability. Then we'll be talking about the gap between IEC requirements and the real-life scenarios in the MENA region. Next, we'll talk about extended reliability testing as a tool for procuring quality PV modules. And then we'll talk about real-life situations and failure modes. And then we'll end this with a quality of production lines, as it is very important to hear that from a manufacturer's perspective. As many have, of you have already joined us, I'd like before to hand for handing over to Tristan, I'd like to learn more about you. So we may customize the um, session as we move forward. And for those that are watching and uh, on Zoom, we'll see a question, a poll on their screen asking about your industry. So please tell, you, tell us if you are developer, EPC and so on. And if you are um, on social media, then please write that in the comments and we'll be picking it up from there. As I can see, approximately 25% so far are consultants, around 15% developers, another 15% EPCs, 10% energy services and operations and maintenance, and we see around 9% from government and nonprofit. So a wide range of um, specializations that we find in here, 
I'm very happy to have you all on board. And my next question is to determine your country or region. Um, if you are also on social media, please tell us from what country you join us. And if you are on Zoom, then please select the most suitable um, uh, choice. Unfortunately, Zoom restricts us with only 10 um, options, so we cannot list the names of all the, co the countries, but you will see here the regions as well. So far, around 35% from Arab GCC countries. 20% uh, from Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Iraq, and Jordan. We have 15% from Egypt, 15% from uh, Northern Africa. And um, uh, we see people from Africa, Asia, Europe, Americas, and other regions as well that we missed to include, apparently. So um, without further ado, I want that we jump in into this session. We'll be having 20 minutes approximately with Tristan and then approximately 20 minutes with Kevin. And then we'll get back all together in the end to answer your questions in the Q&A section. Please do not delay your questions till the end. Just write them as soon as you get them in the Q&A section. This way you help us to prepare and to make sure that we answer your question during today's session. Thank you very much for joining us and I'm handing over to Tristan. I'm very happy to have you on board, Tristan. Yeah, very happy to be here. Uh, let me just share my screen and we'll get started. Cool. Yeah, I can see it full screen. Excellent. Thanks so much. So Notice. as you mentioned, my name is Tristan Irian Larico, Vice President of Sales and Marketing at PB Evolution Labs. And thanks for having me today. I'm quite excited to be presenting some of our test results on today's topic. So the agenda of my presentation will be as follows. I'll start with a quick introduction of PVEL and our parent company, Kiwa. Then I'll provide an overview of our product qualification program or PQP and how it relates to IEC testing. Then we'll have a look at some of our different tests and how the results compare to IEC testing as well as to the as well as to field failures. And then I'll have a couple slides on our quite popular PV module reliability scorecard. And then I'll do a quick conclusion. So for the short introduction. For those of you who don't know us, PV Evolution Labs, or PVEL, as we're known in the industry, is the independent lab of the downstream solar and storage market, and we're based in California, USA. We're quite well known for our annual PV module reliability scorecard. The 2021 edition of the scorecard was accessed over 20,000 times from over 80 countries. And the 2022 edition of the scorecard was just released three weeks ago and already has been accessed many thousands of times. Our mission since our founding over 10 years ago is to create the data that matters for the solar and storage industry to have higher adoption. As you can see on the screen, we provide a wide range of services to the industry, all of which are focused on advancing our mission. We work with companies all over the world, including banks, developers, asset owners, insurers, consultants, et cetera. And we have over 400 downstream partners in the PV and storage stakeholder community, which we support with data to de-risk their procurements and projects. And finally, in 2021, PVAL became part of the Kiwa Group. So who is Kiwa, you ask? Well, it's a global testing, inspection, and certification company that has been around for almost 75 years and is active, as you can see, in many industries. And based on that flowchart on the screen, you can see that they cover many parts of the solar value chain. This is especially true since Kiwa's acquisition of PI Berlin just two weeks ago. And we're quite happy to have PI Berlin on board and be sister companies with them. So if you'd like to learn more about Kiwa's offerings, uh, please contact me. So now looking at the, the PQP or product qualification program. Uh, we launched it, the module PQP, in 2012 with two goals. One, to provide the necessary due diligence data to the downstream, and two, to provide third-party recognition to module manufacturers who are producing reliable products. One key aspect to the PQP is that the sample modules that get shipped to PVEL are factory witnessed during production, which is a gating step for every PQP that we test. 
Our in-factory auditors follow a multi-step approach to ensure that the bill of materials being used in the modules we receive has been verified and recorded in detail. This is then included in our PQP factory witness reports and from there can be extracted into bomb exhibits that are provided to the downstream free of charge for use in their procurement contracts. Specifying the exact bomb or bombs that did well in PQP testing is one of our key recommended procurement best practices and you'll see why in some of the upcoming slides. So here's a simple visual showing how the PQP and PVEL is positioned in the industry. On the left, you can see that manufacturers sign up for testing. And in the past, we've had over 50 module manufacturers doing so. As PVEL publishes test reports, the manufacturers can approve having PVEL share them with our downstream partners, of which, as I mentioned, there are over 400 from around the world. These companies on the purchasing side of the industry use our reports to help guide their procurement decisions and encourage manufacturers to participate in the PQP. Another key principle of the PQP is that it's updated regularly to provide module buyers with consistently relevant data as new technologies and manufacturers manufacturing sorry, techniques are introduced. So the current test plan for the PQP is shown on screen and was released last October. These updates are in response to feedback from the market, including downstream buyers, asset owners, financiers, independent engineers, even the manufacturers themselves and independent research institutions. The PQP, as you can see, includes a number of tests designed to address a range of known PV module failure modes, as well as in-depth module characterization at different radiances and temperatures and light angles. The test durations go beyond what is required for IEC certification, as I'll show in the next slide and discuss through much of this presentation. PQP participants submit their factory witness samples for all of these tests and reports are released throughout the project's duration. The reports again are available for free to PVEL's downstream partners. And one more plug on that, if you'd like to sign up as a downstream partner, please contact us via our website, pvel.com. Okay, so on the screen now, you can see the IEC 61215 test plan, which is the main certification test in our industry. There's also a 61730. It's a safety test where 61215 is more of a quality um, certification. So you can see some of the overlaps between PVEL's PQP and the 61215 testing. And indeed, our PQP builds off of 61215. So for example, 61215 requires 200 cycles for thermal cycling, and the PQ, but the PQP requires 600. 61215 has 1,000 hours of damp heat, and the PQP goes to 2,000 hours. So a comparison of the other tests is shown in the table on the left. And I think it's quite clear that the PQP goes further than 61215 in many of the tests. But there, there's a reason for this though. 61215 is setting the minimum bar for participation in the industry. It's used to remove any truly bad designs that won't last in the field for three or four or five or six years. But 61215 is not designed to give buyers confidence that modules will last 25 years in harsh environments. That's not what it's for. And people assuming that certified modules are all they require to procure re reliable products will be sorely disappointed if and when field failures occur. So to address some of that gap in 61215 certification and extended module lifetimes, IEC introduced 63209-1 last year. And the test plan for that is on the screen. You can see in the table that there is better overlap between PQP and 63209-1. So both have 600 thermal cycles, damp heat 2000, a sequence of static mechanical load, dynamic mechanical load, thermal cycling, and humidity freeze. They both have 192 hours of PID and they both have a back sheet test. But that's about where 63209 ends. So there is no LID test or LETID, which is light and elevated temperature induced degradation. There's no PAN and IAM performance tests. There's no field exposure. And I think most importantly, there's no requirement for a factory witness during sample production 
for 63209, meaning that the manufacturer can send golden modules or you know, hand picked the best modules they have, they can send those off and the bill of materials has won't have been verified by a third party in the factory. So while 63209-1 is a good step above 61215, it's missing some key elements. Okay, so that was sort of the introduction on to some data. So this first example is from thermal cycling where the modules are chilled to minus 40 degrees Celsius, then heated up to plus 85 and then cooled back down. So while the temperature is increased, the modules are subjected to maximum power current, which stresses the modules bypass diodes and soldering. In this case, we have a module that did well following 200 cycles. That's the 61215 test duration, and that's shown on the left of the screen. And there's just a little more than 1% power loss. But as shown on the right for the same sample module, after the second round of 200 cycles, the, mod the module suffered a catastrophic failure due to short-circuited bypass diodes or an internal open circuit in the module. It's sometimes difficult to tell what the problem was, but one of those two things caused a third of the module to go black. This results in the module output dropping by a third and is sometimes referred to as a sub-module failure. They can be quite prevalent in batches of modules and it is something that certification testing rarely detects because you know, this didn't happen after 200 cycles, it happened after 400 cycles. Looking at how this compares to the field, the National Renewable Energy Lab or NRAIL in the US did quite an extensive study on the lifetime equivalent for thermal cycling when it comes to module solder bonds. In the graph on the left, you can see that thermal cycling to 85 degrees, which is what 61215 and the PQP requires. For 200 thermal cycles, that would equal about nine years in the desert environment of Tucson, Arizona in the US. But it would be over 60 years in the temperate environment of Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So if you're installing in a northern temperate environment, you know, maybe 200 thermal cycles is all you need. But if you're installing in a desert environment, that 200 thermal cycles is only going to be, you know, eight, nine, 10 years. And it's not predicting the future, which is where the 600 cycles from the PQP comes in. On the right side of the screen, you can see a module we tested from a portfolio of sites in the US where one third of the module was not functioning. And we were able to trace this to poor soldering in the junction box. 2% of modules in this portfolio had this issue leading to lost revenue and significant costs related to module identification and replacement. It's also likely that other modules in this same fleet will fail over time due to natural thermal cycling. And that gives the site owner very little confidence in their portfolio's performance in the coming years. So we think it's quite clear that the extended thermal cycling is necessary, especially for harsh environments because it identifies these types of module failures. Okay, switching to damp heat now, that subjects the module to 2000 hours at high temperature and high humidity, instigating corrosion and delamination in susceptible modules. Note that the 61215 requirement, as I said previously, is 1000 hours, we double that to 2000 hours. Again, we can see on the left side of the screen a module that did quite well following 1000 hours of damp heat, it easily passed the IEC acceptance criteria of less than 5% power loss. However, after going back for a second round of 1,000 hours, that same module shows this corrosion issue, uh, which is around the cell's perimeter. You can see that darkening in the EL image. This leads to power loss that is higher. Uh, it, it was almost 13%, and that's higher than 95% of the modules that are subjected to this test. So definitely an outlier, but something that easily passes certification and does not do well in the PQP damp heat test. And here's an example of damp heat issues in the field, which typically occur in hot and humid environments. You need the humidity. So around the coast, for, for sure, um, has these, these high humid environments. So PVEL tested a bomb of tier one modules and noticed bus bar corrosion and power degradation following our damp heat test. These were IEC certified modules that had done well in the certifications, thousand hours of damp heat. 
The developer who installed these started seeing issues within a few years and visual inspection of the modules revealed evidence of moisture ingress in the laminate and significant signs of corrosion, as you can see in the image on the right. 100 megawatts of modules had to be replaced for this issue. It was on, honored under warranty, but the developer had to pay over 10 million US dollars to cover the labor cost for module replacement throughout their fleet of sites using these modules. So not good. And again, shows the relevance of damp heat testing. Okay, for this next test, it's our mechanical stress sequence, which as I said earlier, combines static mechanical load, then dynamic mechanical load, thermal cycling and humidity, fr humidity freeze. And this is to create, articulate and propagate cell cracks in susceptible modules as would occur in field conditions. This type of loading can occur due to extreme wind events and you know, in Northern environments from, from heavy snow loads and things of that nature. So here we have two similar bills of material produced by the same manufacturer. The only difference between bomb one and bomb two was the glass and encapsulant suppliers that were used. On the left, the module did quite well. It would have been considered a top performer in our scorecard. On the right, the module passed the IEC test, which is only static mechanical load with no subsequent stress testing. But when we take that module and put it through the full sequence at PVAL, the module has greater than 5% power loss and you can see the EL image is full of cracks. Compared to bomb one, you know, the, the difference is quite stark. And of course you would rather procure bomb one than bomb two, but without PQP testing, you would never know that there's a significant difference between the two. And for the field equivalence of mechanical stress testing, we've seen a number of catastrophic failures within the last year during this test related to glass breakage. This is quite surprising as we do the test using the traditionally most conservative mounting with rails running perpendicular under the long frames, a quarter of the module's length from either end. So this is you know, very conservative mounting. And we're also only applying 2,400 Pascals, which is the 61215 minimum static load. So in this particular example, the frame sealant failed leading to the glass being ripped out of the frame channel and then the glass breaking. On the right side is an image uh, from a publicly available report on module performance following a couple of hurricanes in Puerto Rico. Uh, that's, that's in the uh, US uh, territory. The red arrows point to two modules where the laminates became liberated from the frames, similar to what we saw in the lab. So the frames are still there, but the laminate flew out of the frames, which is what we were able to mimic in our test. So again, showing that our tests match what is happening in the field. Okay, a couple more, uh, a couple more tests here before we move on. So here we look at potential induced degradation and we use high temperature, high humidity and high voltage to instigate PID which is the short form for potential induced degradation in susceptible modules. Again, here we have two different bombs and th both bombs are from the same manufacturer. They have identical cells and many other materials, but also some differences, as you can see, such as different rear encapsulant, different back sheet, et cetera. And clearly those differences are impacting performance. The bomb on the left is a top performer with less than 2% degradation following this test. The bomb on the right passed the IEC 61215 requirement, which is less than 5% power loss after 96 hours. You can see it just squeaked through with less than 5%. This module would therefore have become certified and could end up in your project. But which would you rather invest your money in or for all of you consultants, which would you, you know, tell your clients to invest their money in? Bomb one or bomb two? You know, I, I think we'd all choose bomb one, but you need extended reliability testing to determine that. And quickly for a field example of PID, I've used one that we highlighted in our 2021 scorecard. Although there are many examples of PID issues in the field. So if you research it, there's, you know, just Google it. There's lots of PID examples in the field. So 
for this one, this is a site at a research institute in Morocco where a PID issue led to module degradation that was 4% per year. So just to be clear, that's not 4% degradation in total, that's 4% annual degradation rate. So most financial models assume a module degradation of about half a percent per year. So if you have 4% per year, that would be considered catastrophic for long-term financial viability of a site. You know, that, that site is going to become bankrupt, basically. As shown in the graph, the highest degradation rates were on the more negative side of the thousand volt string, which is to be expected as PID is typically higher in the negative polarity. Um, and if it was a 1500 volt string, it would probably be even higher amounts of degradation. And finally, just to touch on uh, PVAL's backsheet durability sequence, this was incorporated in the PQP to address backsheet cracks in the field. We built off the work from DuPont's mass testing and our backsheet durability sequence has been shown to reveal backsheet polymers that are prone to cracking. You can see those little cracks in these images here. So there's lots of examples of backsheets cracking in the field. Again, some searching, you'll be able to find them. Uh, here's a picture from a desert environment. I believe this was in Nevada. United States. Um, so if the back sheet cracks, this, this can lead to moisture ingress, corrosion and safety issues, and typically requires a full replacement. But some manufacturers have been offering repairs, but repairing the back sheet is a major exercise. And uh, it's best to avoid back sheets that are prone to cracking. So those were the tests that I, I thought I'd highlight. There's a few other tests in the PQP. I don't have time to get into all of them. Uh, if you have questions about some of the other tests, feel free to ask them here or contact me. Uh, but now moving on, I'll just briefly discuss our recently released scorecard. So we released the 2022 edition of the scorecard three weeks ago, as I mentioned earlier. It has lots of insights into our test results and their meaning for the industry as well as highlighting 25 different module manufacturers listed as top performers. And they produce 122 top performer module types that are listed in the scorecard. For the first time, we've also included a searchable database of the top performers, including filtering them by cell technology, cell size, factory location, the PQP test, and some other metadata. So you're really able to drill down into who was a top performer and what are their module types. I obviously encourage you to check it out. The URL for the scorecard is modulescorecard.pval.com. And regarding our sponsor today, Longi, um, their appearance in this and previous scorecard editions, I'm pleased to report that they have been listed in the scorecard since they began making modules back in 2017. Previous to that, Longi was making wafers and cells, but they really entered the module market in about 2016. We got their modules then, we tested them, and they were in the scorecard in 2017, and they've been in the scorecard ever since. And in this year's 2022 edition, Longi's LR472HBD bifacial modules were listed as a top performers in all test categories. There was only six module models to achieve that status. So of the 122 module types that are listed in the scorecard, only six were a top performer in all categories. So congratulations to Kevin and, and Longi for the excellent work on that. And finally, to my conclusion, um, hopefully you've learned that certification testing does not fully determine if specific bills of material are worth investing in and you see the clear value that PVAL's PQP brings to the industry. Again, we go further into these topics in our scorecard, so please check that out. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and of course, I look forward to answering any questions you may have. If you have additional questions beyond that, please contact me directly, um, info at pval.com or via our website. Thanks again. Thank, thank you, Tristan. You.
I appreciate uh, this input and very valuable information, data, images from the site that you have shared. That's very useful. Thanks a lot for this trust and for sure this stimulated plenty of questions that we got here in the Q&A section or on social media, but we push them till the end after Kevin's section and then we get back to you uh, for some answers, please. Excellent. Looking forward uh, to it. Thanks, Tristan. Then uh, I'd like to invite uh, Kevin Robinson, please, from Longi, uh, who'll be working us through some uh, real case, um, some real life uh, situations and some failure modes, and talk to us about the quality of uh, production lines from the perspective of a manufacturer. Welcome on board, Kevin. Thanks, uh, Monif, and uh, thank you, Tristan, for that uh, introduction and a little bit of a a plug there about um, the results of the reliability scorecard. Um, actually, <laughs> I've been a fan of yours and the, the PV Evolution Labs um, uh, test process for, for quite some time, and I'm, I'm really glad that we can um, share some information here today. So what I'd like to do is not specifically a company presentation, but just uh, share a little bit of learning um, that I've acquired over, uh, over the time that I've been involved in this industry, but also in a previous life uh, coming from, from the electronics industry. So during this presentation, I'll give you a quick introduction, um, two slides on our, on our product range. Um, I'll little, talk a little bit about um, highly accelerated stress screening and highly accelerated uh, lifetime testing. Um, and how we address those in terms of uh, Longi in our in-house uh, testing. Um, show a little bit of, of pictures from the field. Um, these are all uh, projects that I have seen with my own eyes. Um, and we'll talk about some of the things that, um, that have actually caused these uh, problems on site. And, and then just as a conclusion, just try to wrap up a little bit and, and uh, share some insights about um, what I think you should be doing if you are uh, contracting with the module supplier in terms of, of some of the things to look out for. With regards to our product series, we, we have the two main uh, product series at the moment, the HIMO 4 series and the HIMO 5 series. The HIMO 4 being um, the module that is based on the um, 166 millimeter uh, wafer and HIMO-5 being the, the 182 millimeter um, uh, solar solar wafer. Um, both of these are based on our um, gallium doped uh, mono wafers. And um, both of them are half cell modules with um, a nine bus bar cells um, using the, our proprietary smart soldering technology. So apart from that, our new focus is moving into um, the standardization of our products with regards to the, the 182 millimeter alliance. Um, so together with our um, customers and partners, um, what we're looking at is trying to standardize on the, the product ranges um, to ensure that we optimize the bill of, um, our bill of materials and the costs associated, associated with that, um, but also starting to look at how we um, can ensure that from a mechanical point of view, uh, we're able to better integrate and uh, better interchangeability um, with regards to these products. It also helps us to um, start to optimize um, cost, particularly when it's looking at things like uh, structures and trackers. Um, and then in, in a month or two, um, we'll be sharing uh, some more information about um, a new high efficiency product that we'll be launching later this year. So first of all, um, you know, what is highly accelerated stress screening and, and sort of where does it come from? Um, you know, from my point of view, I come from, uh, I, I'm an electrical engineer and after or, or during the qualification process, we, we had to do internships. And this is where I first learned about um, this type of testing. So in this particular instance, I was working in um, uh, avionics, um, military avionics and maritime uh, products. And what we used to do is uh, because of the high stress environments, um, do quite a lot of tests to, to try and break products, um, determine where their failures are and um, you know the, the, the cause and results. So for example, ingesting, injecting high voltage into electronic components, um, freezing the products to, to minus 60 degrees and heating them up. And what you start to see is which are firstly, first of all, which are the, the, the components that break first? 
Um, but not only that, um, if, we, if the components break and we repair, repair them, what is the next uh, failure and, and how does that impact on the reliability of the product and also the, um, uh, the actual durability? So, so this is where, where it comes from and this has been applied to, uh, to this, the, the PV module business. And as Tr Tristan mentioned, we, we look at this from different aspects. So first of all, um, looking at it from a materials point of view, um, utilizing uh, suppliers such as DuPont and the, um, their MOS program to understand how materials uh, degrade under, um, under these stressful conditions, exposure to ultraviolet high temperature. Um, in, in terms of, of Longi, um, how do we address this? So in addition to the basic IEC testing um, and UL testing, we also um, have got certification in the IEC 62941, um, which lays out the best practice for the product design, manufacturing processes, selection and control of materials in the manufacturing of the P PV modules. Um, and, and the IC uh, 62941, uh, um, you're only be able to get certified if you have already um, passed certification in 61215 and 61730. So this is really the, the, the basis, forms a basis for, for the um, factory order criteria. Um, you know, further to this, we start to subscribe to things like uh, PV Evolution Labs, voluntary testing, um, and their PQP program where they, they test beyond uh, the IC standards. So as Tristan explained, depending on the test sequence, um, between two and three times above the IC standard. Um, and, and for example, one of these is a HIMO 4 series, um, passing a 55 millimeter hail test, um, whereas, the, the IC standard is only um, 25 millimeters. So, so quite a bit there. And Tristan's already shared some results from the um, PV Evolution Labs and, and their methodology. So once again, it, it's, it's quite important to, to consider that because not all modules are created equal. Um, and let's look at what that, that means in terms of the, um, the failure modes in, in the field. So if we look at the, or consider the IC testing, um, it's really designed to filter out these infant mortality failures. So the, the things that you'd first expect to see that happening in the field um, in the first, let's say, two, three years of, um, um, of that module operating in the plant. Um, then what you start to see is uh, these wear out failures. Um, um, as time continues, these wear out failures start to increase. And what that gives us is this blue line, which is the, the observed failure rate. So by participating in these, these type of testings, um, what we're really trying to do is, first of all, with the IC testing, ensure that the inform mortality failure rates are filtered out, um, but then also to de decrease this yellow line to ensure that um, these wear out failures are decreased. And as Tristan has mentioned, this can have huge impact on um, your levelized cost of electricity. Uh, if you need to be replacing modules after uh, between five and 10 years, say for example, um, and you're spending as in Tristan's example, $10 million um, on refurbishing that plant that has a huge impact on, on, on the project viability. So how do we how do we look at some of this these things in our own uh, labs? Um, so we we spend quite a lot of money on research and development, and in the past ten years we've we spent about um, just over one and a half billion dollars in research and development. So that's not only on developing new technologies, but looking at the the module performance themselves and the the processes and uh, reliability of the products. So you know, in our internal laboratories um, relating to module, module specifically, um, a number of different chambers, um, we can do all the, the tests that are certified by um, outside bodies. Um, and we subscribe to these type of testings, but we also subscribe to um, actual destructive testing and see how, how long it takes for, for products to break. So one of the ways that we do this, um, 
these are uh, um, examples of mechanical uh, stressing that we do on the modules. Um, in this particular example, um, we can either apply a static load to the module. Um, we can do cycling where we put negative and positive displacement on the modules and cycle that. Um, and, and really the idea is just to see um, how durable that product is, not only from a mechanical point of view, but to ensure that we don't have um, the, the solar cells cracking and causing uh, degradation problems um, over time. So this is just a look at what, uh, what an example of this test would look like uh, when we stress the modules. And then just looking at it from a different angle. So what we can then do once we've done this testing, as I mentioned, um, we can either do destructive testing. So we just carry on doing these cycles until the module um, starts to break, whether that's the glass, the frame, um, we, we will, yeah, we will, so we'll continue until it breaks. Um, what we can also do is uh, apply cycling, then take it out, do temperature cycling, and just evaluate how the, the, the stresses that have been applied on the cells and then start to develop as, um, as the, the module is exposed to, to the different temperature conditions. Um, because especially once you start temperature cycling, at the, if there are any cracks in the cells, we'll start to see those develop. Um, and we can pick up that by doing the electrolumin electroluminous testing, flash testing, and we can, we can actually then understand how the module uh, degrades. These are some examples, uh, real examples of failure modes that we have seen in, in modules on site. Um, in this particular case, the, all the top ones are various different um, backsheet failures. Uh, the first one, in conjunction with the backsheet failure, there was some issues with the quality of the soldering. Um, so as the backsheet started to degrade, there was moisture penetration, which caused corrosion in the, in the bus bars. Um, and we can see even in this instance, um, uh, burning on, on those bus bars. On the bottom pictures, we can see how um, the, the corrosion in the bus bars has caused a hotspot, um, which ultimately caused the, the glass to shatter. This is quite a severe case, the, the bottom middle image. Um, in this case, the back sheet had degraded so much that um, the, the, the glass shattered and the module actually started to, to fall apart. Um, in the last case there, um, this isn't as severe as I have seen. Um, this was just a photo to show that how the, um, a burning diode has actually caused um, the, the plastics to, to degrade there. Um, in some instances, I have actually seen that these junction boxes can actually start burning. And I know of one power plant where it actually caused a fire and 90 modules were burnt. Um, on that particular plant, there was grass. So as soon as the, the plastic started burning, um, the grass caught fire and started um, to make that fire. So all of these pictures, um, these are taken from modules that were in the field. Um, this was particular plant was a 75 megawatt plant and uh, 70 megawatt of modules had to be replaced in, in this instant. Looking at another uh, failure, we can see a, a junction box or uh, internal string disconnect. Um, what has happened in this case, Tristan, Tristan mentioned it before, but we can see how the, the voltage has um, decreased. So this is um, data that has been captured by, um, by DuPont. DuPont do field studies in various power plants around the world across uh, different environmental conditions. And I think what's quite concerning is to have a look at the amount of, of failures, observed failures that they see in the field. So, um, you know, almost, uh, almost 23 3% of modules um, of all the, the observed modules in the field that they, out of their observed um, uh, modules, um, have failed so in some sort of way. So that's, that's quite concerning. And once again, um, starts to show the importance of ensuring that um, 
extended reliability testing is performed as part of your, um, your qualification process. Uh, if we break that down into the difference between uh, rooftop and ground mounted, um, the failures in, in rooftop and ground mounted installations, we start to see how those defects uh, increase with rooftop projects. So once again, this is just an indication that in, in, in higher temperature environments, um, these kind of considerations become uh, much more important. So just some things that uh, you as a customer can um, do to ensure that um, you are getting the, the, the best in class quality and reliability is first of all, to do uh, extensive due diligence on the on the, the 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 company and the product themselves. So ways that you can do this is uh, ensure that um, you've got up to date factory certificates, uh, product certificates um, for the specific products that you um, are, are interested in, making sure that you have pan files that are verified by by third parties, and this is quite important, especially for. Uh, customers active in the commercial industrial space, um, we don't actually have the, the, the capital or, or maybe the resources to start looking at some of the laboratory testing that we do for your utility scale projects. So this is where some of the extended reliability testing becomes important and why PV Evolution Labs is, is quite an important and the report that they, they issue is, is something important to consider. Um, so I really would recommend at, at a minimum looking at the kind of suppliers um, that are participating in this extended reliability testing. Um, actually, I'd like Tristan to comment on this because I have seen some results from, from other testing, but very important to know the, the bill of materials. What we, we do see is that um, bill of materials get qualified, um, but it might not necessarily be the bill of materials that is used in your project. So um, very important to understand a bill of materials. When you're doing the contracting for utilities, um, uh, projects, it's very important to um, agree on the quality criteria. So something that I heard the other day, which I quite like, it's easier to plants where there, there is um, quality problems, even though the module manufacturer has um, replace their module according to their, their um, warranty criteria. Something where we can help on as well is to agree, uh, agree on any pre-shipment criteria. So looking at factory ins inspections, um, module batch testing before the modules get shipped to the utility uh, project. And then most importantly, agree on the type of revenues um, that we would look at if there are things like serial defects on, um, on any of these power plants. And then finally, to finish up, just a quick look at some of the references that we do have in, in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, sorry, actually, I did include desert conditions here as well. Um, this particular project, 123 megawatts in, in Chile, um, in, in desert conditions. Um, in Argentina, also in desert conditions, 200 megawatts. Um, in, in desert conditions in China. Um, uh, 390 megawatts in, in Benban. And we've just uh, concluded a few projects in, in Middle East as well. Um, the, the latest of those being uh, 800 megawatts for uh, in Qatar, um, where the idea of that particular project was to cover 20% of the, the peak load for, um, for Doha. Thanks uh, very much, Manif, and uh, back to you. Thanks a lot, Kevin, for this very informative um, presentation. Uh, we've learned a lot from the say about the same topic, but from a manufacturer's perspective. This brought us also a couple of questions on social media and here in the Q&A section. I'd like to ask you both, please, Kevin and Tristan, to join me in this Q&A section to answer the questions that we have received. If you have any questions, please send them in the Q&A section. If you have it, if you want, you can even send it in Arabic and I'll do the translation as most of our uh, attendees are from the Middle East. Feel free to submit your question in any form and we'll be happy to 
uh, answer. I'll start with you, Tristan, as we I've got a very, let's say, I think a topic that goes towards the testing procedures that you have. And, uh, and we have an anonymous attendee who asks, is testing after IEC 600-68-2-68 for blowing sand is sufficient? What about dust blowing and settling dust test? Should this also be considered? Um, I'll, I'll leave it to you to tell us what's your take about this. We, we talked about this in the preparation sessions a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, sure. So good, good question there, whoever anonymous is. Um, to be honest, so PVEL, as I mentioned, we're trying to address the gap between IEC certification testing and what the buying community requires. And so it's it's really our downstream partners that come to us and say, you know, this is a known gap, uh, or I'm, I'm experiencing this type of failure mode on my site. I, I need it to be addressed, and PVAL invests in the test equipment to be able to perform that function. We haven't had to do that for sand testing um, and, and sort of dust testing in the past. We, we've done at our outdoor test lab soiling studies on like different glass coatings. And, and things of that nature and, and on different cleaning, uh, module cleaning robots or, or methods. Um, but we, we don't have the capacity to do that uh, IEC uh, sand test. And I imagine, well, first of all, because we don't do it, I, I'm not well versed in it, but I imagine that it is sufficient to address most of the concerns in the industry or else PIVA would be getting knocks on our door saying, hey, we need you to develop a better sand test because this one isn't sufficient, you know, like they've done for 61215 related testing. So obviously it's an important issue, especially for desert environments, but I would, you know, I need to assume that the IEC test is sufficiently addressing those concerns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Tristan. As a follow-up question from Mr. Sayed Abu Tagir, what about sold humid test? Um, probably as a follow-up to what you're saying. Yeah, so there's there's a salt mist corrosion test. Again, mm -hmm. is an IEC test, and it's a fairly standard certification. Um, same sort of answer. I, I'm, I believe that the six one two one five test is sufficient for, for you know, installing along the coast where there would be high levels of of salt mist, or a, installing say floating solar in marine environments. Um, again, PVL is not being asked to develop an extended salt mist test, which leads me to believe that that what's in IEC is, is currently sufficient. Okay, perfect. Thank you for this, Tristan. I think that um, move now to Kevin, please, because you, I think you stimulated people's, let's say, thoughts about the reasons for modules failure. As you pointed out, especially that backsheet issues are one of the most common, let's say, reasons for such uh, failures. And I've got two, three questions in here in this regard probably I'll just combine them just to make this uh, quicker. Um, there's a question about what kind of, uh, let's say, back sheet does Longi use? So how do you address this problem as Longi? Do you use like, I don't know, some of these, let's say, uh, commonly used probably um, um, uh, back sheets. There is also some kind of branded ones like the Tedler ones we hear about in the market. So what is your standpoint in here and what do you use in Longi just to yeah, um, um, understand how you, let's say, address this issue? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I just want to take a step back quickly and, and just sort of add a few comments to the, the previous question. So with regards to I see 600, um, 68-2-68. Um, you know, I think there were two parts of that actual, the, the actual question, if I interpret it correctly. Um, the, the sand dust testing as part of it, but then also the, the actual on-site, um, uh, let's say soiling that actually happens on-site. So normally with the utility scale project, um, it would be, be important to understand the, the actual on-site soiling um, as a part of your due, due diligence process. So, so that's something that a, a 
sort of a project developer would probably actually um, do separate studies on that that specifically. And then I think with regards to Tristan's comments about the the salt mist testing, um, Tristan, I'm pretty sure guys will be knocking on your doors. I think floating solar is <laughs> relatively new. Um, so I'm sure we're going to start to see uh, failure modes happening in, in um, especially as uh, some of these plants are now starting to be built in um, uh, on the on the on the actual ocean itself. So yeah. I'm pretty sure that will will develop. Um, with regards to backsheet, uh, it's a very important topic, and you know it's something that we do place quite important um, attention to. So of course, um, Tedler has been mentioned. We do work with Dupont on their uh, with their Tedler based backsheet. Um, they're quite an important partner because they, they pay such a lot of um, attention to this specifically, um, especially with their, um, what they call the material accelerated stress screening. So they'll do um, different test sequences one after each other um, in order to try and uh, stimulate these kind of failure modes. So um, yes, we do use Tedler. We do use other manufacturers as well. Um, you know, and I think part of this is to try and make sure that we have a diversified supply chain. Um, we don't ever want to become too fixed or too reliant on, on a single supplier. Um, but of course, the other suppliers would go through a similar qualification process to ensure that we have a, a product that is reliable and durable uh, in line with our uh, quality standards, as well as uh, some of the third party testing, such as um, the testing that PVL does. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, just a quick one, then also like in the same direction from Mr. Samir Tabit. He's asking, what about the defects in glass and soldering? So how, how, how do you see this? Is, how common is this in the market? And what do you do as Longi to prevent that? Yeah, okay. So, so this is also quite a... Um, considering the size of the industry, um, you know, at the, at the moment, if you're doing... Um, you know, you mentioned that we've got a production capacity of over 65 gigawatts. And even if you have a 0.1% failure rate, <laughs> that's quite a significant number of, of modules. So of, of course, the, the, the certification process is important. Um, the ongoing testing. So even though we participate with third party testing, what we're always doing is taking samples from production. So in our own internal laboratories, um, depending on the type of, uh, of testing um, that it is done at the different stages, um, we're doing that depending, you know, at different times. So, for example, the soldering, the first one that we do is on a regular basis. We're taking um, strings out of the, 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 the soldering machine, type of stringer machine, and we're doing what we call peel tests. So we um, put the, the, the cell in a clamp and then we try and pull the, the, the solder sold a tab off that cell and we're testing to make sure that that is um, a reliable uh, solder. So that's the one test we do. Um, uh, and then some of the other tests that, uh, you know, Tristan has mentioned um, to ensure that the, the product is reliable and durable. So, the, yeah, there's a various, various mm -hmm. different ways that we do that. With regards to, with regards to glass, um, I think that... You know, we on on that part apart from from the the testing we do on the completed module, the that part becomes a little bit more difficult because that that does rely on on the supplier themselves. So, I think where the biggest problem comes in is either process problems with anti-reflective coating, um, or if there are actually glass defects. So that's pretty much where we see the biggest failure rates. Um, so although we, we do do qualification and testing on the on, on incoming goods, um, those are typical typically problems that we'd see at a later stage. But you know, once again, um, you know, that's where it's important to ensure that you've got a good relationship with the module supplier um, and deal with how those um, defects will be be dealt with. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Kevin. And uh, I see plenty of relevant questions. That's why I think for everyone's benefit, I'd like to ask you guys to remain with us for another 10 minutes. Sure, so no let's extend the session for 10 minutes. Is it okay? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'd hate to leave the session without answering at least, let's say, most of the questions uh, that we have in here. So, um, uh, Tristan, I'll, I'll get back to you probably just before. There's a question that um, from Mr. Sayed, who's asking for the top performing modules, but I think they can get back to the scorecard, download it, and check the, the names from there. I think that's, yeah, exactly. that will be easy. Yeah? So I've posted the link in the chat. So you please click on the link. You can download the report. And then like uh, I think this will be easier than listing them verbally in here. Um, the next one is uh, from an anonymous attendee again. What are the expected additional costs for PQP if we require them from a manufacturer? I don't know if this goes more yeah. towards it, Tristan. Mm -hmm. That's that's a great question. And uh, as you can imagine, on a public webinar, I'm not going to share our, our <laughs> exact pricing. Uh, I will mention that it it is somewhat related to the module design. So, you know, a module with a polymer back sheet needs the back sheet durability sequence. If it's a glass glass module, it doesn't because there is no back sheet cracking on a glass glass module. Um, and bifacial costs a little bit more than monofacial. The, the point though, is that the way the PQP works is that there's a consortium of downstream companies asking the module manufacturers, asking Kevin to do the PQP. And the cost then of the PQP is shared amongst all of those projects. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're just by yourself asking the manufacturer to do this testing, then they might say no. But if everyone that Kevin talks to or that the salespeople at Longi talk to say, hey, you need to do the PQP, you need to do the PQP, you need to do the PQP, then mm -hmm. it just becomes a cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, maybe the price of their modules will it raise by half a, half a cent or something like minuscule related to how much it's de-risking the procurement for you. So we started in the US, we've got, you know, the biggest traction in the US. We heard from a recent, you know, one of the big, you know, six manufacturers told us that 90% of all of their projects in the US require PQP. So they just do it. You know, it's, it's just part of bringing a new product to market. They do the PQP. And if people in the Middle East and in Europe and in Africa and in Asia, et cetera, are, are doing the same thing, and 90% of the conversations manufacturers are having, it'll just become standard and the cost will be irrelevant. So mm -hmm. that's how it works. You know, if you just want to do it for your one project, well, then it's going to be certainly a few cents a watt and you might decide, well, I can't afford it. So I'm just going to buy these untested modules, which has a risk, a risk that's probably worth more than a few cents a watt. But again, if, a, you know, everyone's asking for it, then really no one on the downstream is seeing the, the cost in their, in their module pricing. I see. Then just a follow-up question because I've got something that really relates this here, here directly. So you mentioned that the cost will depend on like on the components if you're doing backsheet testing or not. But do you disclose the test results? Like would you compare modules, let's say, per their performance for I don't know, soldering or backsheet uh, results? Uh, would this be included in the PQP scorecard? Yeah, so in the scorecard, we name all of the top performers. Of course, we don't name the non-top performers because mm -hmm. then no one would want to test at PVAL. <laughs> so <laughs> we only test the good ones or name the good ones, I should say. Not we only test the good ones. We have lots of bad examples. We only name the good ones. Um, but then really, like the downstream partners can access the, the test reports behind the scorecard and get to see, you know, a little bit more behind the scenes of, of what the data shows. Um, now, it's up to the manufacturers to decide if they want to share those reports. If their results are really bad, like we mm -hmm. recently had the worst damp heat performance, it had 54% degradation, and that's the worst in our 12 years as a lab. <laughs> They're probably not going to share that report. That report is getting, you know, 
in the back of the filing cabinet. And now they got to go back and figure out what did they do wrong in their, in their bill of materials. So the downstream is probably never going to see that specific example, but um, you know, with, with the PQP reports, you can do benchmarking and, and see how these different modules perform relative to each other. I see. Okay. Thank you, Tristan. I think a little I bit away, add to that. Uh, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I mean, from, from my point of view, um, sort of my approach should be two parts. So if you are a, a customer who is doing commercial industrial type projects, you certainly don't have the resources to be able to um, demand these kind of tests. So PQP is a good way to, to say, well, we trust this manufacturer because they participate in this process. Um, so it's a good, let's say, uh, a selection tool when you are uh, looking at commercial industrial type projects. What you find is that with utility scale projects, it's merely a tool to get the attention of the particular uh, EPC or developer. Um, what we then do subsequent to that, because obviously they, they want to know about the test results, but what we do subsequently is to, to inform the what bill of materials they will be selecting for their projects and what testing they will like to do as um, uh, to qualify their, their batches. So if they're doing a 300 megawatt project, there will be a, a criteria to select um, samples out of that. And we will do certain testing based on their criteria. But in that instance, the PQP informs the decisions around um, around uh, the specifics of the, the modules for their particular project. I see. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'd like then to move away a little bit from the PUQP to more general concepts. We have a question. I'd like to ask it for, to Kevin, please. Uh, from Mohammed Al Omar, who is asking for the reasons of hotspots and if there is correlation between the, the hotspots frequency and the heat or the, the temperature level in a certain region. So uh, do we face uh, hotspots more often in hot areas or it's not connected? Um, I think there's two parts of that. So certainly temperature does have an effect. Um, hotspots, generally speak, speaking, tend to be related to um, some kind of defects in the, the way for themselves. So whether there are issues, quality issues, um, those, those will definitely generate um, hotspots. Um, have, we've lost you a little bit, Kevin. We can't hear you. It's kind of muted. Okay, I'm not sure what happened there. I can hear you. Um, I can hear you. Yeah, okay. So... It's, I'm not sure, so I'll start again. So I think there's two parts of this. The first part is that um, it seems like there are the, 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 the main cause of hotspots is defects in the, the actual material, the wafer, and sort of during the cell manufacturing process. So over time, the cell will start to degrade as a result of building up some kind of internal resistance in the cell. Um, and, and then that essentially ends up like a heating element. So as it generates heat, that hotspot will develop and ultimately that, that cell will fail. Um, but we also do see hotspots developing th from things like shading. So um, important to ensure that you don't have long-term shading on a, on a particular spot in the module. Um, so that's quite important with design and O&M stages of the, of the project. Um, and then soldering, obviously that does have, have, has an impact. Um, that particular type of hotspot, though, is a different mechanism. But, um, you know, once again, just as the resistance builds up in that solder connection um, with the current, it, it starts to generate heat. And if it's bad enough, then ultimately it will, um, you know, degrade quite, quite badly. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I have a question also for you, Kevin, um, from a perspective of a manufacturer. Um, um, there's a question here in the Q&A about the accuracy of simulations and so on, but I'd like to rephrase it and ask you, in your personal belief, how would you compare the simulation results to lab tests and accelerated test results to real life conditions? Like, do, do you see these tests as a decisive indicator that would 
highly predict the performance on the ground or how would you connect them, please? Yeah, so so simulations are quite a quite tricky because the accuracy of the simulation actually depends on the the data that you inputting into that um, uh, that particular project that you're working on. Um, the way that we ensure that the the module data characteristics is um, is accurate is once again uh, submitted to a lab like um, Pival. What they'll do is they will study the, the model uh, in that pan file, all the, the characteristics, and then they will do tests to verify um, the data in that particular um, pan file. So they'll look at things like um, IAM, so the, the characteristics of um, your light losses as your the angle of, of um, light hitting the module. Um, so they'll look at the degradation or the losses as a result of that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a whole whole list of stuff that they they look, but we can also give you those reports from um, from third party consultants who verify the accuracy of that particular um, pan file. So that's that is that's important. Um, but yeah, I mean, once once we're out of control of the the pan file, um, that accuracy is highly dependent on on the actual data on uh, that's mm -hmm. that's used in the simulation. Okay, thanks. So if, we're if there are any particular um, questions that they have got, we can have a look at that and and uh, make some ad advice or recommendation on their particular simulations. Perfect, perfect. Thank you for that, Kevin. So you've been very generous for us with us. Uh, for that, I want to close four more questions with yes or no answers from you, please. Sure. Yeah, I just like to make as much how many people happy as possible. So first, two questions to you, Tristan. Do you have radiation tolerance uh, for solar cells tests? Anything towards that direction? I'm not going to give you yes or no answers to <laughs> <laughs> um, radiation tolerance. I assume you mean UV testing, um, mm -hmm. like ultraviolet radiation. Mm, if you mean like nuclear radiation, <laughs> you don't have that test. Uh, for UV, yes, we do. We do UV. We do UV testing. That's great. Thank you. And for Osama Zawi, who asked this question, please send an email to Tristan in case you're, uh, you would like to know more. And another one, like, do you cooperate with uh, academic institutions uh, and some research programs? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, we, we, we do that. Uh, places like NRAIL, uh, ISC Constance in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, UNSW, in um, Australia, Diwa in Dubai, Dubai. you know, mm -hmm. um, they, they use our data, we use their data, sometimes, you know, of course, it's anonymous, uh, unless we get the manufacturer's approval. But, you know, they'll come to us and say, hey, have you ever seen this in the field, we're seeing this issue or in your test results, and, and vice versa, we'll show them like, no. Look at these cells after EL. Sorry, this was supposed to be a yes or no. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the answer. <laughs> I don't know why Osama asked this question, but if Osama, if yeah, you're in research... If you're interested. We're, yeah, yeah. we're definitely interested to learn from you and vice versa. Okay. Yes, yes, yeah, That's yeah. awesome. Perfect. Thank you for that. Then Kevin, also a little bit challenging the yes and no part. Um, I have a, two questions actually from Mr. Ewell von Asuncion. I'm not sure if I uh, read your name properly, but at least I can lead, read the questions in English. Um, uh, so he's asking if we are mix. If, is there any galvanic effect if we mix steel structure with the panels that have aluminum frames? Is this a problem as an installation? Um, yeah, it's a yes or no answer. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> it depends. Um, in hot, dry climates, um, you should be okay. But as soon as you start um, mixing materials and you have, um, you know, especially more humid sites uh, where there or there's salt, um, you are going to have to start to have some some issues here with galvanic erosion. Okay, thank you for that. Another question from him. The difference between 600 volt and 1000 volt system is this something that is relevant to the local country, or do you see the whole industry like moving to the 1000 volt? Um, 600, as far as I understand, is mostly a US um, uh, a US standard for most of 
the standards outside of of us it's either 1000 for commercial industrial rooftop projects and 1500 for for utility projects okay perfect thank you very much kevin tristan okay. and kevin i'd uh, like to thank you for your generosity today and the information and the answers i'd like to thank all of the attendees on zoom and the social media we had hundreds of people today across all of these uh platform and you asked awesome questions today very much in depth. And I think uh, some of the questions were even sometimes challenging to answer, um, which is something that we love. This means that you've been engaged with us. Hopefully you learned a lot today and you joined us for the upcoming sessions with Longi and PVL. I'm sure that we will get back to you before the end of the year with some more informative sessions like that. So thanks a lot for everyone. And I wish you a beautiful day and a sunny one, especially if you have PV on the, on the roof of your house. <laughs> Have a good day. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you.